Anyway, welcome to the latest uh, edition of my weekly webinar here at, at Epic Street. As always, a special thanks to everyone at Epic Street for making this event possible, for continuing to invite me back. I, I do really do enjoy these, doing these events, not only because I just I just dig talking about the markets, talking about trading, talking about the so-called fundies, you know, the fundamental forces um, be, behind the global economy that can uh, affect money flow, that can affect affect the values of uh, the valuations of uh, currencies and currency pairs. But you know, I also just enjoy collaborating with traders and also learning at these events. I do learn at events like this. Uh, I catch comments by uh, traders who uh, may, may uh, be aware of uh, any developments in their part of the world, any news that I may have missed. And believe me, I miss my share of news. I'm one. I'm a kind of a one-man, you know, uh, operation here, so to speak. I don't have a team of researchers doing work for me. I know I do leverage the work of other um, of other people through, you know, the, the internet uh, via Twitter and and monitor certain websites, certain blogs, and and certain uh, you know uh, economists and such, but uh, yeah, again, I don't catch everything, so uh, it's 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 good uh, it's good benefit to me as well to um, uh, share this time of volume. So, welcome to today's webinar. This is free day, right? Free day at um, at FX Street. So, for those of you who are special visitors to uh, because of a free day, welcome. Let first I'm remind you the purpose of this event is education. I'm not going to provide provide specific trade alerts or recommendations. Uh, the the typical um, uh, agenda for this is like we take a look back at the uh, the past week or so of price action. I'll I'll stress some highlights of uh, of key trades over the past uh, several days and and any news which um, might have uh, uh, fueled those trades, fueled the moves upon which the trades are based. And also take a look ahead at uh, from time to time at uh, what the next uh, few days might bring in terms of news. Uh, and even uh, it, it, from time to time, look at some uh, uh, what you might call some longer-term technicals. You know, look at a look at a, well, a look from time to time at a daily chart or a weekly chart for a for a major currency pair, and then the five key technical levels that could uh, dictate price action in the coming sessions or days, if and when uh, uh, price action reaches those levels. Uh, where to start here? I tend to start with this latest move on the euro, which you can see on the upper left. Let's start with the summary here, because especially for anyone who's new, uh, I'm going to give you um, a look at uh, or give you a verbal description of the charts you see here and why I show them. Uh, from upper left to upper right, uh, three uh, major pairs, uh, all with the dollar in common, euro USD, pound dollar, Aussie USD. These are all 15-minute charts. These are all charts without indicators. Yes, there's, there's several lines on these charts. Those lines are are uh, classic support and or resistance lines. In some cases, trend lines. Uh, my um, my style as a coach and as a trader is to defer uh, first and foremost to lines. Of, I'm sorry, to charts without indicators, just basic support and resistance. I also to uh, use um, uh, on many sessions and many days news flow to help me define my uh, short, medium, or long-term bias. I do use charts with, indica with indicators, which you'll see in a little bit, but uh, when it comes to uh, defining trade setups, first and foremost, I look to price action. I look to price action to at least suggest to me where a pair might find support or resistance. Then I look for uh, uh, the charts with indicators, which again, you'll see in a moment, to, um, to look for other sources of prospective support or resistance, depending on what kind of trade I'm I'm looking for a buy or a sell. Uh, so on the on the top, I look at the USD pairs, especially the Euro USD, the most heavily traded currency pair on the planet. The most liquid pair uh, is uh, certainly the focus of uh, not only my trading but especially of our coaching and boot camp. We do look at plenty of other currency pairs for sure, and it's starting to increasingly do so. Look at other pairs, given the relatively low, 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 low lower volatility we're seeing in the currency market these days. I'll address that volatility. I'll talk about the volatility over the course of this um, of this webinar. Bottom view, uh, I look at some of the other markets, S&P 500 futures, the front month contract for S the S&P 500 index futures. S&P 500 is the benchmark stock index for uh, for the U.S. equity markets, so uh, I like to get a look at uh, at least what U.S. stocks are doing. I do watch separately, although, although I don't show it here. I do watch separately other markets, uh, especially during the uh, New York morning session. Keep close tabs on the uh, European markets, uh, Germany's DAX index, the uh, 
the Cox Roll, the main French stock market index, especially these days, the IBEX 35, the main Italian stock market index. And that gives me a, those, these indexes, these stock market indexes, uh, especially in Europe, give me a sense of, um, of the market mood, the mood not just in the currency market, but especially in other markets, uh, stocks or uh, even look at the bond markets as well, watching the, the German boom, the uh, of course, the UK, the U.S. Treasury market, the U.K. gilt market, such and things like that. And the reason why I'm looking at the, while well, I'll, I'll check uh, S&P, S&P futures from time to time, or even oil futures or spot gold, as you see here as well. The reason why I check those things is, um, you know, one of the themes that has moved the currency market so frequently in the past, what, uh, like five, nearly five years here, at least four years since the advent of the, or since the onset of the global financial crisis. One common theme, one common trade for currency traders has been the, the so-called RORO trade, risk on, risk off. You know, risk on generally means uh, in, investors and traders seek uh, or put money into riskier assets such as stocks. And the, the whole risk on, risk off mo- thing hasn't been as good lately. The correlations between currencies and the uh, equity markets, for example, haven't been as, as solid lately. But uh, you know, generally, when you see a, a broad risk on move, you'll see some variation of, say, dollar weakness and yen weakness, and then risk off when markets are fearful about things, you'll often see some form of a, some variation of a dollar strength and yen strength. But let me be clear, that that so-called ro-ro trade, risk on risk off, hasn't quite been as solid, hasn't quite worked as well lately. The correlations are, are a little more intermittent, a little more mixed. Uh, you know that could be due in part to lower volatility, but you know again these are issues we'll talk about. we can talk about uh, later over the course of the webinar here. So anyway, I I, I like to check the uh, the you know, stocks and the stock market, stock futures such as, as U.S. stocks for example, even oil. I look at the, uh, the oil is my peek into the commodities market, and then uh, gold uh, certainly uh, can be an indicative. The moves in gold can be indicative of things as well. Gold uh, I I found more reliable. Uh, when the market was uh, speculating on the prospect or not of more quantitative easement by the Fed. We saw U.S. news, which was worse than expected, which prompted speculation about uh, another so-called QE, uh, QE program by the Fed. Gold would shoot up uh, when the um, perceived odds uh, by traders and investors of uh, more quantitative easement by the U.S. Federal Reserve, when the perceived odds, uh, odds were lower due to, say, some sort of uh, bet, better than expected U.S. economic data, gold would drop. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll st- we still keep tabs on gold in my uh, live coaching sessions at FX Bootcamp's New York FX Trading Room, but uh, it, it talk about some trade setups from there from time to time. But again, the, the focus here and the focus at Bootcamp certainly is uh, currency. Also, another view I look at here, and we can uh, get into some um, talking about some trades and some setups and such in the, in the past uh, few sessions and days. Uh, here's my view of the end crosses. Uh, upper left ASEAN, upper right CAD yen, lower left euro yen, lower right pound yen. Now, th- you know, th- actually, this uh, this view here shows a uh, uh, an interesting example of a concept that uh, I, I think is worth mentioning again. I'm, tr- I'm trying to get a, get into an even more frequent habit of of uh, discussing this in my live coaching sessions at boot camp, and, and it's, it even mentioned in here, and that's relative strength, relative strength. Let me activate my drawing tool to uh, explain this. Notice how um, you can look at the euro yen and pound yen. Euro yen high established today, earlier today, right there. Euro yen did rise on the back of renewed euro strength following the uh, uh, Spain's uh, uh, budget announcement. For the, the, the 2013 budget was announced, uh, what a little more than an hour ago. And the euro rose in response. That euro did not manage to make it back up to today's earlier high. Same with pound yen. By contrast, the uh, ASEAN CAD yen, as I'm highlighting now on these uh, upper charts, uh, both made new highs for the day. So you're seeing, so you've seen at least recently some relative. Oh, actually, not just recently. Overall, overall, you've seen some relative strength in the so-called commodity currencies, especially recently on the CAD yen. CAD, the Canadian dollar was a, a little weaker earlier, but uh, found its way back up. So choppy price action on the uh, uh, on the Japanese yen against the so-called uh, uh, European currencies. Uh, more definitive uh, upper price action on the uh, for the Japanese, uh, actually weakness from the Japanese yen, if you will, 
against the uh, commodity currencies. One conclusion I would draw from this view, by the way, is that uh, the Japanese yen arguably has been mixed. The Japanese yen has been mixed. I don't see the yen as it didn't, certainly didn't see it today as one of the best uh, uh, trades, one, one of the best vehicles, if you will, to trade. And that's actually largely been the case for much of the week. We had one exception, which I'll uh, highlight here. I could do so on the euro yen because I do recall the euro yen got a nice pop yesterday. And if I zoom out on this euro yen 15 minute chart, you can just see it. In fact, it's the fact that it's so a little so difficult to see. Uh, I'll have to uh, have to point to it with a marker. That was the what I'm pointing to now is a green candle. This is again a 15 minute chart for the uh, euro yen currency pair. That green candle was uh, marks the response uh, of a Japanese yen selling pressure against the euro, following comments during, I believe, yesterday's New York morning session, uh, comments by an official at the Bank of Japan about uh, the prospect, I believe, as I recall, of more quantitative easing by the central bank. You may recall last week we talked about this. Uh, last week we saw um, some notable yen strength following, eventually yen strength following a uh, a Bank of Japan decision to increase its asset, its asset purchase program by some 10 trillion yen. And uh, the market had been speculating that for, for several days before the announcement, following the announcement, and we talked about the reasons why last week uh, the Japanese yen actually did firm up. And so uh, there was a brief, a brief inflection, if you will, on the Japanese yen, some brief yen weakness. I talked about this in my live coaching session at the uh, in our uh, New York FX training room yesterday. What I essentially said is that uh, you know the record of um, extended Japanese yen moves in response to you know uh, comments by uh, Japanese officials, especially at the Bank of Japan, it's it's not it's not been good. Now we did have that yen sell-off as I discussed previously. We did have that Japanese yen sell-off following the FOMC announcement the week before, but uh, that that yen sell-off arguably was due in uh, large part, initially at least, to uh, speculation. Uh, about the uh, intervention by the Bank of Japan. So the uh, sharp, rather sharp yen sell-off, reasonably sharp yen sell-off following the uh, uh, the Fed's announcement of the so-called QE3 program. It, yen crosses were up for several days. Bank of Japan made its announcement about more QE. Uh, seemingly that was price stand, or perhaps the market was disappointed that the Bank of Japan didn't, didn't do uh, more aggressive easing. Yen has rallied, and really ever since then, the yens have been uh, much like this, uh, what you see on the euro yen, pretty stagnant. I'm not saying you can't trade this. It, 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 it can be tradable, but you, uh, you, you certainly need to have your so-called scalping hat on. And uh, in my mind, uh, you, you really need to define some uh, some trustworthy levels or, or you know, sources of support and resistance before you, uh, you, know, you pick your battles here, whether it's to go long or to go short. But the yen, ever since that... Um, Ever since that yen rally uh, in the wake of the Bank of Japan announcement last week, the Japanese yen's been really neutral. So I, I haven't paid a lot of attention to the, uh, or I haven't spent a lot of time focusing on during my live coaching sessions this far this week, the Japanese yen. Now, could the Japanese yen you know, awaken again, you know, as soon as like the next Asian session? I suppose. You know, I, I'm kind of in a wait and see mode when it comes to the Japanese yen. Or and you might say, uh, uh, in a reference to the uh, U.S. state of Missouri, I'm kind of in a show-me state, a show-me state. I'm looking for the end, the, the, the Japanese end to prove to me that's going to uh, show some price action, show some movement before I uh, get serious about trading it. Uh, I see a couple of uh, comments, a couple of questions on the, uh, in the uh, chat here, so I'm going to check it, check it out. Yeah, Andy, that uh, certainly looks plausible. Uh, Andy talked, asked about... Uh, uh, heading back up on the beta currency, you know, unless we see um, uh, the market get spooked uh, by this uh, whole, whole fiscal cliff situation, or unless you see in the case of U.S. equities that the um, uh, the, the steam in that move, the, the steam in that uh, the recently bullish moves in U.S. equities has uh, fizzled out. Uh, you know, I, 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 I got to admit, I, I hate, uh, given the conditions, which I'll discuss in a minute, given some of the conditions favoring the Aussie bulls, I, I'll admit, I, I hate betting against them unless I have a really, really, really good compelling uh, technical or uh, depending on the news out of Australia or China, for example, uh, if I have some sort of at least temporary fundamental reasons to, to bet against the Australian currency, for example. Uh, trend of the euro yen, Jack asked about the trend of the uh, still uptrend on daily. 
Well, let's take a quick look at the daily chart before I get to this back to some of the USD pairs. And I'm probably best served by going to a separate Euro Yen chart, a chart which is a little cleaner, it has a, a few less lines on it. I'm going to go out to a view of Euro pairs here. Here's a Euro Yen chart, currently a 15 minute chart, which I'm about to convert to a daily chart. There we go. Yeah, we've seen a similar we've seen a similar retracement down of the uh, euro's prior rally starting in late July with the um, ECB president Mario Draghi's uh, speech at a London uh, conference for investors. Uh, remember the Draghi, the infamous Draghi, uh, believe me, it will be enough speech, which I referred to in past webinars here. Uh, that's where this uh, this euro rally against multiple major currencies, including the Japanese yen, started, and now we're getting. Um, uh, that this move down of late, eh, due, due to an, at least in part to the yen strength, especially following the Bank of Japan meeting last week. But uh, the, the bigger story here, in my opinion, has been the um, over the course of the past several days on daily chart. The bigger story has been the euro. Has been the euro. So um, uh, Jack, the you know you, you could argue at least technically, based on something as simple as that, that uh, we, we're kind of a it almost looks like we've broken the trend line, but I'm not ready to call that a break yet. And by the way, I've got this trend line cast in red. I want to cast it green. I like using green for uh, perspective sources of support and red for, for perspective of sources of resistance. So, Jack, from a technical perspective, you've got that green uptrend support line there. You've got, you may recall, you may note the uh, lows, the recent lows around 99.50 to 60 zone. I'm referring to, as I my drawing tool, lows here. Uh, Jack, I must admit, I must admit this has some potential for a uh, uh, a head and shoulders pattern with very, very uh, uh, low shoulders, and that's certainly a possibility. The news today out of uh, Spain with the announcement of the 2013 for, uh, for uh, 2013 budget for Spain, you know, perhaps that's going to uh, at least uh, settle any uncertainty about what the you know what the Spanish government's going to do next in terms of uh, you know austerity measures and such. I tell you, folks, keep an eye though. Keep an eye on not just Spain, but even other parts of uh, uh, the southern periphery of Europe. Uh, I don't know how many of you noticed. There's been some. Uh, there's certainly been some protests in, in Spain. Even some uh, uh, some protests, uh, although I'll be at peaceful for now. Some po some protests in Portugal as well. And of course, the the whole the, the whole uh, question mark about you know Greece and what kind of shape it's in. Yet to be answered as well, but you know, I don't think we may not we may not have any answers about Greece about the Troika's uh, assessment of Greece until after the U.S. election. I don't know if you really, if any of you saw a story about that last week, but it looks like uh, the 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 report from the so-called Troika, that's representatives from the European Union, the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, representatives representatives from those three organizations who are who are uh, who've been assessing. Uh, Increases progress or lack thereof on with regards to budget cuts, austerity measures, and such. Uh, that report not due out until um, at least the latest rumors I've heard. We're talking that you know at least October. You know, and of course October is next week. But the last report I saw last week was uh, we're talking perhaps uh, not until after the U.S. election in early November. So the, the focus uh, for, for now is, is, is still back on Europe and specifically on Spain. Of course, the Spanish budget uh, announcement's out of the way with uh, today, and we saw the euro uh, jump up a little bit in response to that, which I'll talk about in a minute. But then you've got um, uh, a report tomorrow. could be as, at least as important, if not more important, because it's the report. What's, out, what's due out tomorrow is um, the results of the uh, Spanish bank stress test. In other words, a uh, Sort of a report card due out tomorrow on the Spanish banking system, and you know, frankly, that's that's where the that's really the epicenter of the of um, arguably the the epicenter of the crisis in Spain. I mean, the problem started with the banks, and you have uh, you know governments like in, the, in this case Spain, you know, bailing out the banks, and it puts the government balance balance sheets in, in trouble. I'm not saying that Spain didn't already have some troubles anyway, but um, you know, uh, bailing out the banks has certainly been um, uh, part of the issue. Another thing I'd like to use to define trend is the Fibonacci study. 
if you draw a FIP study of the move up from the uh, late July low to the recent high on this uh, euro yen currency pair, we have dipped moderately below the 38.2% FIB, but uh, we have not challenged the 50% FIB. And also, you can just see on this uh, chart, Jack, we've got some highs here as well. Look at the price action back in uh, in in June as well, through here. Got some lows through there. So that uh, like the, the 99 area. The 99, the 99 area could be technically at least a real deciding factor whether or not this uh, recent uh, trend on the euro on the and against the Japanese yen continues. And by the way, that's not even that doesn't even address uh, uh, other uh, ways to measure trends such such as moving averages. I'm gonna look especially at a, a euro yen uh, uh, trade daily. Uh, while I'm waiting for the charts, I see you got a question about a new world currency. You know, those those rumors have been uh, have been per, per, uh, perking up uh, for what two, three, four years here. I'm not uh, I'm not expecting it to happen anytime soon, but uh, is it a possibility? Yes, I, I I'm not expecting it though. Frankly, not expecting. It. Okay, the, I'm I'm lost my patience on this MT4 platform. I'm, I may have to do a a restart of the chart. Sorry about that. I want to turn off the chart and then restart MT4. This isn't the first time, one of the first times this has ever happened during a uh, uh, FX Street web webinar. So apologies for the uh, technical difficulties here. I'm restarting MT4 now. All right, you should have charts. You should have charts. Let's try again what I was looking to do, which was to go take a look at the uh, Euro Yen chart. There we go. The Euro Yen chart I'm about to show you is a daily chart, and it does show some um, uh, some monthly pivot points. Specifically, monthly pivot points for the for September, which is uh, nearing its end right now. But I'm focused especially on the moving averages. And this is for Jack. Before I continue on with uh, other topics, Jack, we are still for now above the uh, daily 55 EMA. So all the although the uptrend has slowed, the uptrend hasn't shifted yet. You know, I, I, miss, I'm, I would admit I would be uh, more bullish about this pair if it were above its 200-day uh, uh, EMA and 200-day moving average, which it isn't yet. But uh, my point is, by by some measures, you know, the uh, Fibonacci retracement levels, um, you know, previous resistance here, uh, moving averages, uh, the trend line we discussed earlier, which is somewhere in through here, by some measures, the, the trend is still up. Now, you know, one potential one potential game changer. I'm not making any predictions or calls about it, but uh, you know, again, keep an eye on um, the uh, the results of the uh, Spanish bank stress test released tomorrow. Of course, uh, any uh, uh, social unrest in Spain could certainly um, upset the apple cart as well for the uh, for the euro bulls. Uh, I'm debating about the order about the next topic, so I tell you what, I'll, let's talk about I'll talk real quickly about this uh, this bounce on the euro. I want to talk about the Euro trade, talk even about the Aussie trade that we discussed during today's New York morning session. Then I'm going to get into um, uh, uh, the topic I mentioned earlier about volatility in the currency market. I, I'm actually going to walk through um, uh, at least some of the content from my recent blog post on the forexstreet.net. Uh, I don't know how many you caught. The title of the post was uh, uh, JP, JPM DXY uh, G7 uh, Deja Vu. A mouthful, by the way. So try to say that past ten times. Yeah, I, 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 I thought there were some interesting findings from my analysis of uh, volatility by session on uh, the EURUSD. I've actually got two things to show you: volatility by session, and also volatility, um, a more uh, granular look at volatility by time of day. If I have time to cover that. But first, the uh, the trade on the euro, and not just on the euro, but also on the Aussie and arguably on cable as well. We had. Uh, as I expand this Euro chart, and perhaps I got too much on the chart, so let me uh, minimize some things here. I admittedly have come become a pack rat when it comes to uh, lines in my chart, prior source of support or resistance. There we go. And I want to emphasize that near the top of the chart, the 1.29 psychological level with the gray line right there. And I'm going to make a thicker green line at the bottom of the chart, 2835. 2835 was near the uh, near the lows established yesterday.
Okay. So I've, exp I've just expanded the chart. So bottom line, bottom line, here's what happened. We've been, we were waiting virtually the entire uh, New York morning session. In fact, pretty much did. Wait the entire New York morning session for one news event, and that was the announcement of uh, Spain's budget for next year. Uh, we had some U.S. news during the New York morning session. We, just, we talked about the news in advance. Uh, what we discussed was the likelihood that uh, the market would just uh, virtually ignore the U.S. news. By the way, the U.S. news, not so good. Very, uh, a very recessionary tone to today's U.S. news reports. Uh, durable goods orders, um, not so much jobless claims, but even the uh, uh, revised, um, uh, the final revision to, to second quarter GDP, but certainly durable goods orders, not, that was a very poor report. Uh, certainly we'll also report that uh, I would keep an eye on next month. U.S. Durable Goods Orders report for next month, or for, sorry, for this month, released next month. Uh, that could attract a lot of attention. And, uh, durable Goods Orders hasn't been a notorious market mover for the USD or really even for the, uh, for the Japanese yen. But given how poor this uh, today's report was, uh, perhaps it will attract more attention and uh, raise some concerns about, uh, you know, if the U.S. is already entering recession anyway, you know, what effect could the so-called U.S. fiscal cliff have? And the fiscal cliff issue, probably not going to have time to talk about today. We could talk about that perhaps next week. <clears throat> anyway, I wanted to highlight with this view of the 15-minute chart, the lows from yesterday. Near the lower middle portion of this chart, the lows established yesterday around uh, 1.2835. Now I don't show it, but there's a you can you can ha also have a linear chart, a, arguably a thicker line of the chart around 1.2850. Well, the 1.2850 level uh, has been important uh, on a, a number of occasions in the past. I could show you a longer term chart, but uh, in, the interest of in the interest of time, I want to get away from that. One thing that that that, um, that caught my attention is that the, whether I like it or not, whether I whether or not I think it's important, I have uh, seen some uh, commentary on some news services, for example, Trade in the News, who, who cite um, uh, citing Forex dealers who reference that level is important. So, you know, right or wrong, whether, even whether or not I think it's important or not, what I really want to know is, you know, what does the trading world see? What does the trading world think is important? And uh, I thought it was interesting the Forex dealers cited that level as uh, potentially important. And, you know, certainly it, it's held up. The area, I should say, the, the 1.2850 zone or area has held up. They did generally held up yesterday, held up earlier today here. And what we got was um, once the uh, uh, Spanish uh, budget minister uh, began to uh, do his uh, deliver his uh, press conference and, and unveil the uh, budget for next year, uh, the euro initially sold off, but again found support near yesterday's lows and uh, turned back up. Now the reason for the rise in the euro is debatable. I haven't even had time to, to uh, sift through the entire uh, uh, budget presentation by the Spanish budget minister. But my my sense was that uh, uh, probably the one thing that, mar that caught the market's attention the most was the uh, perhaps all, merely a promise. Not uh, I mean, there may not be uh, any reason to uh, any good reasons to believe it's going to uh, it's going to come to pass. But um, it was a statement by the budget minister that the Spain would meet its deficit target for this year. That Spain would meet its 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 deficit target target for 2012. That perhaps, uh, as much as anything else, probably uh, sparked the uh, euro jump we saw. Now, was it an easy trade to take? No. In the in the face of uh, what's been red all day, especially more red than green over the past several days. But uh, again, knowing that the 2850 area has been important in the past, knowing that it held, uh, uh, know, know that the 2835 specifically held yesterday. It was not a crazy trade to take. But the trade, honestly, I liked because of relative strength was uh, the Aussie long around uh, just above 104, the psychological level. So while the euro was has dropped to and it's stalled in the uh, area of 128.35, that, uh, again, the horizontal green line on the euro chart uh, representing yesterday's lows, the Aussie, the Aussie USD currency pair was uh, at a uh, at a recent, uh, tr basically a 24-hour trend line plus a level that had affected this pair in the past. Let me uh, shift this chart over. Probably zoom out a little bit here too. Okay, I'm uh, sure you can. Uh, hopefully, you can see the case there for the uh, for the purple upfront support line. I kind of should make that green because, uh, as I said earlier, I usually use green for upfront support lines. 
Sorry for down 10 reasons. Fine. There we go. So the Aussie had been one of the firmer currencies, one of the stronger currencies over the past 24 hours. The, the broader trend has been down, which I'll, uh, I'll reference that uh, red trend line in a moment. But the more recent mood has been up. Some, some broad Australian dollar strength uh, over the past uh, 24 hours or so. So you have the case for the uptrend support line, which I'm highlighting the lows that suggested that. And if I, um, if I zoom in into this 15-minute uh, chart and look at more recent price action, you can see even on the 15-minute chart, now for whatever reason, you know, chalk it up to the HFTs, the, the trading programs, the algos, highs here and lows here. So that 104.05 level seemed to influence price action as well. So there you go, trend line and uh, the 104.05 area. That was as is so the case what the, the case for the long there was uh, Aussie at perspective multiple sources of perspective support as the euro was at support. The idea was if the euro does rise, a rise in the euro often accompanied by dollar weakness, broad dollar weakness obviously needs up for this pair. And also if you uh, if you're long on this pair and break above uh, these recent highs. The highs around uh, 104.25 level, and you break above this uh, red trend line, which I'll explain in a minute. You possibly trigger some stop losses and uh, get a bigger move up. So that was a nice move on the uh, on the Aussie, which we discussed that possibly today near the end of our our coaching session. Uh, let me show you the. Uh, I want to keep track of um, comments and questions here too. So sorry if I've missed one. I'll get back to it in a moment. I want to show you the basis for the. Uh, for the red trend line. Yeah, this chart's a little busy, but I, I can emphasize with the marker uh, the red trend line. The high here established just a few pips above 1.06 in the middle of this month, and the high there established uh, what 21st of September. That's the basis for the red trend line. So again, we broke above the red trend line. We broke above the uh, today's earlier high on the Aussie. I'll say, you know, other than that, uh, that this 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 move in the dollar following the Spanish budget announcement has been one of the more prominent moves this week. It's, it's, it's I won't I won't mince words. It's it's been a uh, it's been a challenging trading week, and in fact, it's been increasingly a challenging market to trade, uh, especially ever since the news events, which we've been anticipating. At least I've been anticipating for, for weeks now. We're, we're we're kind of past a lot of major milestones in terms of uh, in terms of news, notable news events. Uh, you know the the German constitutional court ruling earlier this month it was it on September 14th, the FOMC meeting, the um, even the Bank of Japan meeting, but even before uh, and then before that the uh, ECB uh, decision and meeting earlier this month where the uh, ECB was anticipated to announce a new bond buying program and did in fact do that. So uh, the market uh, has been um, moving, especially the euro has been rising on the back of a speculation about what those events could bring. As it turns out, those events that did produce uh, the outcomes, the decisions that market were largely expected. And now we're kind of left with the uh, the after effects. So we're kind of uh, left with the, the wake of uh, of those events and kind of the market. Uh, I feel like the market's in a state of looking for, looking for the next, next thing, you know, what's next. So let's get the volatility here. Before I do, uh, I'm just going to check the um, comments and questions. Anyway. Yeah, I see Andy's comment about the first obstacle is naming a world currency. Yeah, and Andy, it could take even if even if that were decided, folks, it could take. Uh, I mean, it could take years to sort that out. Years to sort that out. And you kind of think there's good. I mean, we we could spend an hour talking about this. I don't want to. I don't want to devote too much time to the idea of uh, to the topic of uh, a single world currency. But uh, let's put it this way: there's some. Um, there's some. Uh, uh, some, some strong economic powers out there who have, uh, by some measures, a relatively weak currency. They don't want to give that up anytime soon. And certainly the U.S. with its with its so-called reserve currency. Again, this is this is something that could take years to sort out. Even if the, even if uh, if if the powers that be and the major uh, the major developed world co countries, I mean, throw, I guess throw China into the mix as well. Even if, even if they decided today that they're going to schedule a meeting to uh, something like sometime next year to discuss that thing, it, it, it's way off, way off. 
And by the way, I, in my humble opinion, one thing that would potentially uh, uh, spark um, uh, demand for a, a single currency would be um, uh, some unique volatility in the currency market, which is, can wreak havoc. And right now, we don't have that. Right now, we don't have that. Yeah, Gam calls the currency gold exactly. Yeah, Andy, we could be in a kind of a relative hold mode until after the U.S. elections. I mean, it, it could be a, a, a very, very interesting end of the year. I'll t say the, the final six weeks to two months of the year. Uh, because maybe it's maybe it's then that we get some um, uh, some answers about uh, uh, Greece. Uh, if not before then, then maybe by then we'll have some uh, we'll know how the uh, situation in Spain is uh, going to play out from here, and then certainly the. Uh, uh, the market uh, might speculate on uh, what the U.S. fiscal situation will, will look like. Let me open this. Um, I'm going to open. I'm going to show you some images here. These are images again that I posted or graphs that I posted on the uh, my recent blog post at forexfree.net. Uh, so volatility. Here's what I did. I, I've noticed. Uh, I noticed a number of our, our bootcamp members, and I've seen. I see it in the charts as well, but I certainly heard it from members. Who had attended our uh, uh, Coach David Pegler session in our London FX trading room, talking about how tough London is, and I could see it on the charts. But I, admittedly, I sleep during the much of London session because I'm coaching and, and trading the New York morning session, and sometimes I'll trade the Asian session as well. But London session is one session. I admittedly I don't trade much. It's usually sleep time. I, I, sometimes I'll set alarms, and I get uh, if an alarm is triggered, and I. Uh, uh, get get a good setup, and I'm you know wait for it. That's what I've been looking for. You know, I'll take that during London session and manage it a little bit. If it turns profitable, then uh, you know set stops and go back to sleep, so to speak. But um, otherwise, on many days I'm, I'm I'm asleep during London session. But I I see I see the uh, the price action on the charts, the the relative lack of volatility, and and hear sort of hear about it from our uh, members who attend our, our London trading room that uh, you know London's been tough lately. So. Uh, I, I want to take a look and see, you know, how tough has it been? You know, what, let's let's put some numbers behind this. How tough has London been, by the way, the euro nearing 1.29 right now, so it's still a continued weaker tone to the dollar following that um, uh, Spanish budget announcement. So here's what I did. I looked at the range for the London session and New York morning session. So at least some of you may have already seen this graph on my uh, on my blog post. Maybe there's a boot camper or two in here who uh, seen this me present this in our New York FX training room. Uh, I've I've actually presented a similar graph in prior blog posts, but this graph is recently updated. This reflects the uh, price data on the Euro USD currency pair through last Friday. So I, again, I do not I do not show. I have not updated this graph to to reflect this week's price action. This shows price action through last Friday. Here's what I've done. I've, I've taken um, uh, this, these lines show you know, a whole series of data points, day by day by day by day, for, for each uh, of uh, uh, a couple of different sessions. I'll, I'll explain what these, these lines means in a minute. But I want to explain the, the data, what's, what the, the number means, what the lines represent. The lines represent what's called a moving median, a moving median. So let's take, uh, let's give you, let's, let's consider an example of what that would, what that would, would look like for a single data point. Uh, if you took, uh, I'm going to make up some numbers here. I forget what the numbers are, but I want to make up some numbers here. Let's say you look at the range for the Euro USD currency pair in the past three London sessions. And I, I show, by the way, two different definitions of London session here, and I'll, I'll explain why I did that in a minute. But uh, so let's, let's consider that the classic definition of London session is uh, a 3 a.m. New York time start to about 6 or 7 a.m. I, I, I use 7 a.m. So a London session, if you look at the range for the Euro USD, the high minus low over that four hour time period, uh, and so if you get, if you calculate a range for each of say three different days, let's make up some numbers here. Let's say one, day one, the Euro USD range is, uh, 35 pips. Day two, it's 40 pips. Day three, uh, 27. So 27, 30, what did I say? 27, 35, and 40? The middle number, that's the median number. The middle number is the median. So I, I, I take, I take, uh, I, I look, I look at 20 day windows. For each, for each row, uh, for each 20 consecutive days, what's the number? So, uh, for example, the, um, 
the number for Friday, for last Friday is 71. I show for the uh, New York morning session. Let me highlight this using the marker. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the 20 consecutive New York morning sessions, ending with last Friday's New York morning session, calculate the range for each of those 20 New York morning sessions, and then pick the middle number. That was 70, about 71 pips. 71 median range over those past over those 20 consecutive New York morning sessions through last Friday. Now, why use the median? I'm not going to get into a lengthy discussion about that. Uh, it, I mean, feel free to email, email me about this or make it perhaps chat separately at, uh, separately after the event's over here in the room uh, to explain that. But I find it, when it comes to a lot of financial market data, the median to be a better, better measure. It's, it's a better measure of what the quants call central tendency. The median tends to be a better measure of central tendency as opposed to the average. Because what, what happens in financial markets many times, you'll get uh, you know, get the market doing some normal things, like you know, you'll get you know, so ho from the ho-hum days. Or like, for example, in the London session, you might get uh, uh, five London sessions, like you know, 20, 30 pips, 35 pips, 40 pips, 25 pips, 30 pips. And all of a sudden, you get a unique exception where the, uh, the, the euro moves like 80 pips, a, a real standout session. Well, out, so-called outliers like that can uh, unusually skew uh, uh, the, the data, and it's not a, not a true representation of what, again, what the quants call, what the statisticians call central tendency. And that's what they want to measure in here is what's the, what's the general, what's the central tendency for this currency pair in each, in each session, the New York morning session and London morning session. And I, I describe New York morning sessions at, at the 8 to 12, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. New York time. The classic definition I've seen, if anyone sees different, let me know, but I, as I've researched this, the most common definition I've seen for London session starts at 3 a.m. New York time. I picked an alternative. I show an alternative here for 2 a.m. New York time because um, our London session coach, uh, David Pego, starts his coaching session, uh, as I believe now it's 1.30 New York time. So that's, that's a closer representation to what David Pegler and our members see in his coaching session on the RUSD. And what, what I really want to point out is a stark contrast. I could, actually, you might call it divergence here. Divergence between the, the volatility on the euro, euro during the New York morning session and the volatility on the euro during the London session. Now, is this the only pair to look at? Absolutely not. It's, I'm using the euro as a guide or proxy for the broader currency market. So uh, euro, as of, through last Friday, the median, uh, median move on the euro, if you will, uh, about 70 pips. By comparison, during London session, starting at 3 a.m. New York time, running until 7 a.m. New York time, by that definition of London session, uh, a mere like almost about 30 pips. I mean, less than half of what we're seeing during the New York morning session. Now, I, I, I don't, you know, I certainly don't want to emphasize making too much of a single day's uh, moves on a, a pair like the euro, but uh, to give you an example of this, I mean, Monday, was it uh, Tuesday or Wednesday's price set? It was Tuesday's, I believe. Very typical, very typical what we've seen. And I highlighted this in my blog post on this topic. Uh, London session, the euro stuck in like a 20, 25 pip range. Now, arguably a part of the reason behind that, and you could argue, and I think rightfully so, uh, support at 129. There was simply a battle there. Perhaps the bears trying to push the euro lower couldn't, couldn't do it because there was an at least equal number of bulls. But again, that sort of scenario where the, the euro is stuck, largely stuck during the London session, and then the, side, the, and then the sun rises over the U.S. East Coast, and boom, the euro wakes up. Sometimes it wakes up going up. Sometimes it wakes up going to the downside. Now, now I'm not going to have all the answers for you today. Or right, by the way, nice, nice continuation of the euro there for anyone who's still like either long on the euro or short on the dollar in some fashion. I don't have nearly enough time in this webinar, or really in any in, in any single one-hour webinar, to give you all the answers to how to trade this this, this market. Can it be traded? Yes. Is it tough? As um, Andy implies, I I agree. It's it's not easy. It is not easy to trade this kind of market compared to the market we've arguably become had become accustomed to in the uh, following the onset of the global financial crisis when you saw more volatility. But I, I, the, the point I made near the end of my blog post and talking about this, uh, this volatility data was this, that uh, I remember, I still remember uh, coaching and trading the New York morning session five years ago. The last, let me show you the next uh, point I want to make here. 
uh, J.P. Morgan's uh, G7 volatility index. It's a measure of um, of collective like volatility amongst the so-called G7 currencies. Uh, that index. This was uh, this just shows the index where it stood last uh, yesterday. Yesterday, today it was actually today it closed uh, just below eight percent, something like seven seven point nine percent. But it is, I guess this is a way of measuring not just the volatility on the euro, but volatility on, on several again major currencies. And the, the what uh, I don't show here, I only show it a year's worth of data. But uh, I could tell you that the uh, last time we were around eight. The last time we were around eight on the J.P. Morgan G7 volatility index was uh, late 2007. And the point I made in the blog post was that, uh, again, I remember trading and coaching that New York morning session back back in that time, in late 2007. This, this was uh, following the uh, U.S. subprime mortgage crisis. And yeah, I, I know volatility was lower there, but you know, even then, even then, we found ways to make money. I say we, not just me. But uh, are, are the members at the time and other currency coaches that were, uh, you know, in the room um, assessing trades? And, and I'm sure if you uh, dig up things like um, uh, our video archives of, uh, of a New York session, London session, video reviews, uh, you see examples of trades then. Uh, I'm sure if you dig up the archives from fxstreet.com, you can find uh, discussions or, or articles of some kind of uh, trades then. So I'm um, I'm, I'm saying that it's not impossible to trade in this environment. Is it tougher? Yes. If you, I, should, I would say it's tougher if you're trying to uh, take what's been working for you, the trading style, the selection of setups, time of the day, and, and, and pairs of trade and such. If you try to keep doing what's been, what maybe has been working for you and apply it to the current environment, yeah, you're probably going to have trouble. Are there things you can do? Yes. And, and some examples. Uh, Perhaps you do need to, to, to adjust your um, uh, your trading schedule. That's one option. Uh, it may not be feasible for everyone. Another option could be to um, uh, change the pairs you trade. Uh, there's, there are some more volatile pairs out there that are showing less volatility and other pairs, other crosses, if you will, that move uh, very technically. Now, I'd recommend, also recommend if you trade such crosses, uh, if you go beyond the major currency pairs like the euro, USD, pound, dollar, and some of the end crosses we mentioned earlier, if you go beyond that, in my opinion, you really need to have um, a, a more sound, uh, uh, a deeper understanding of um, some of the fundamental forces that can move some of these individual currencies. And you know that's something you can't just develop overnight. That's going to have to come with time. But I, I haven't said that there are some crosses that do uh, trade, uh, you know, very technically, very nicely. They're worth consideration. Uh, another stra another thing that you can consider doing. Uh, actually, there was an interesting note I read uh, in an article. Uh, I read the article more than once, but I, I caught it again uh, last night in my time. Uh, uh, some, apparently, someone did some research on uh, on real trade data, data on uh, trades taken by uh, you know all kinds of currency traders, at least for one broker. And the data showed that, uh, on the whole, that traders, uh, generally speaking, for uh, FX traders, tend to do better in low volatility conditions. So, I mean, there, there, there are. You know the history does show, at least according to that. So I, I don't have the details, so don't hold me to that. But uh, uh, apparently, the, the, someone has found that uh, low, vol low volatility conditions are conducive to uh, at least uh, proportionally more traders finding success. Again, it may means you just have to uh, kind of adjust your game for the uh, new environment if you find uh, approaches, styles, or a selection of currency or currency pairs that. Uh, that worked before may not be working as well now. Uh, oh, uh, Andy mentioned earlier the um, the high beta currencies, the uh, the Aussie, for example. Uh, I would uh, this low volatility environment. This low volatility environment does favor, in my opinion. Uh, again, it's, it's not going to be every day, every week, every month. The Australian dollar is strong, but uh, this kind of low volatility environment does favor a, a high yielding currency like the Australian dollar. And we all. We already know, at least I already know, that um, there's been some. Um, uh, the Australian dollar is is the, a target for some central bank uh, asset uh, diversification. Central banks uh, who acquire things like, in the case of the SMB, acquires euros. And other central banks are acquiring uh, maybe dollars, for example, other different currencies. Uh, as the central banks rebalance their foreign exchange portfolios, they, they're looking for, um, uh, in some cases, some, some currencies that would. Uh, by many measures, look appealing, and the Australian dollar is one of them. Yeah, 
Andy, that's my definition too. And I see Andy's comment about London's always starts at 8 a.m. London time. I would agree with you. Now the volatility, the volatility uh, that that starts earlier. And I, actually, let me show you that real quick. I updated a, a graphic that I've uh, shown in the past on uh, volatility by time of day. Does anyone recall this one? I haven't even posted this on the blog, by the way. I will do so soon. If not today, then certainly uh, probably tomorrow. Let me explain this real quick. And if you if you don't, if you don't follow the explanation or just simply miss part of it, then uh, don't worry about it. I will uh, uh, post this on our um, on my blog at uh, forexfree.net. Uh, if not today, then certainly tomorrow. Here's what I did. I took uh, I took about six months worth of price data on the euro USD currency pair. I, by the way, I've done this with multiple pairs, not just the euro, but uh, I've only got time, of course, to cover this. I've, I've taken six months worth of data on the euro USD. You can see a reference uh, here. Six months worth of data, and I've I've looked at the average range. The average range. I could take the medium, but I'll take the average in this case. The average range. For each 15-minute candle, or it opens at various times of the day. For, so, for example, the candle, the 15-minute candle, which opens at 8.30 a.m. New York time, it's right there. My calculations show that the average range for that candle, which opens at 8.30 8 a.m. New York time, the average range for that candle, a little more than 20 pips. Yeah, Andy, I, re I really do like this chart. I really do like this chart. Now, now, what does that what does that tell you? What could you do with this information? Well, first of all, one thing that should, should really stand out is this. The, and this I'm going to put this in a, a seemingly some simplistic way. Perhaps the, it may sound offensive to some of you, but I, don't, I, I really think of it this way. I truly think of it this way. The, the Euro USD candles, by and large, just get bigger. The candles just get bigger, on average, during the New York morning session versus the London session, which is in through here. That doesn't mean you can't see bigger moves on any given day during London session. And also, that doesn't mean during the New York morning session that the moves are always in one same direction. I mean, some, some New York morning sessions, will, it'll like the euro may drop during half the session and then rise. I mean, look at today, today's session is a classic example. The, the, the euro spend most of the session, you know, gradually down, 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 and then near the end of the session, boom, we sh the euro shoots up. So it's exceptions like that do happen, but by and large, by and large, on average, I should say, on average, the candles on the euro do are do tend to be bigger. The 15-minute candles on the euro tend to be bigger during the New York morning session than during London session. Now, this 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 pattern of uh, bigger candles during New York than during London, that pattern is is common for just about every major currency pair, except in the one I don't show here, except. Uh, the British pound pairs, particularly pound dollar. Pound dollar, last time I checked, uh, I actually, that's one I haven't finished yet, but I've, I've done some other pairs. Pound dollar, last time I did this analysis, uh, you saw slightly bigger candles during the London session and equal to slightly smaller candles on average during the uh, New York morning session. So, you know, arguably the British pound is you know, still a, a, a viable currency to focus on. Uh, during the London session. Now, does that mean that it's, does that mean it's easy to trade? Does that mean it always moves? No, but it's uh, it's one that does tend to show greater volatility during London than the University of New York. Now, one thing that's, that was new from these findings, I've done this analysis uh, several times before over the past like three or four years. One thing new from this particular analysis, from this recent analysis, is this: I have never before seen such a uh, a notable shift, such a notable shift. That's by the way, S H I F T. Shift. I've never seen such a notable shift at this time of day. That is, uh, I, I mentioned earlier that that uh, the alternate definition of London session starting at 2 a.m. New York time, which we use at boot camp. That um, I'm not saying we, uh, we 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 like our own definition. I'm just saying that we we define our London our London coaching session as, as with with a 1:30 or 2 a.m. start time. It, it's it's interesting how uh, the the uh, market sort of comes alive an hour before. The start of the traditional London session. That's that's why David Pegler at, at our London trading room starts early because uh, you do see some moves begin to unfold before the classic London open, and there's evidence of it right at least on the euro. And then you'll see another jump right here. This, the the uh, vertical bar I'm pointing to right now. That's your classic London open. And you can see the the, uh, the volatility uh, increase significantly 
I say significantly because that's that's what the the, the vertical gray bars are for. These, the, the, I use these to identify you know, what constitutes a significant difference. So, so for example, let's uh, give you a little stat lesson here. Let me redraw this again. Um, so I can, uh, from a from a statistical perspective, if I look at uh, these two, if I look at the if I look at the 15 minute candle, which opened at uh, 2 a.m. New York time over the past six months, versus the 15 minute candle, which opened at 2:15 a.m. New York time. I can conclude from this study there is no statistical significant, statistically significant difference in the range, the average range or size of those two candles. So you see that the, those two candles, uh, the, the, the size of the two candles, uh, which opened at uh, 2 a.m. and 2:15 a.m. New York time, they're both about 15 pips. By comparison, or by contrast, I guess I could say, say if I compare the candle which opens at 2 a.m. here. To the candle which opens at 1:45 a.m. There, according to the past six months of price data on the euro USD, there's a, a statistically significant difference between those two. Now it's not that much. I mean, we're talking about what uh, you know, 10 pips for that one and 15 pips for that one. Yeah, it's not much in the grand scheme of things. But again, it's, it's statistically speaking, it's a significant difference. So that's the the purpose of using this uh, confidence interval for the mean range. Well, oh, thanks, Cam, for that poster. I appreciate that because I, I don't. Uh, I, I like this particular graphic, and I, I drive some benefit from doing the analysis myself. But I don't like to redo everything. If, if someone else uh, done some work that I can, um, you know, leverage for my own coaching, especially my own trading purposes, and uh, you know, I'll model better for it. Anyway, I've, so that's uh, that's something I will post on, the, on my blog at forextreat.net. Not only this graphic, but uh, similar uh, analyses for. Um, for other major currencies, and that was well, here we are near the end of my uh, scheduled webinar. Uh, I, I've I've already made the point earlier about you know keeping an eye on, continuing to keep an eye on Europe, especially Spain. Uh, certainly, uh, continue to do so tomorrow. We got the release, as I mentioned earlier, of the um, results of the recent uh, Spanish bank stress tests. In other words, the, a report card for the Spanish banks uh, from Spain due out tomorrow. So. Uh, you know that could uh, cause you know prompt at least uh, some movement in the euro, as we saw in the wake of the uh, Spanish budget announcement today. Uh, next week uh, is, a, is, is the first week of the month. Always a busy week. You got you got your uh, purchasing manager index reports, uh, uh, the official PMI number for uh, China coming on, I believe, over the weekend or early next week, one of the two. Uh, U.S. ISM reports, uh, the uh, ISM numbers, or not ISM, but PMI numbers for. Um, uh, for Europe coming out, especially uh, keep an eye on these are these are, I'm referring to purchasing manager indexes. Uh, these are reports uh, based on surveys of uh, purchasing managers or supplier executives at uh, especially manufacturing firms and uh, several developed and even some developing economies. It's the first read, the first indicator of the health of these respective economies in, 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 in September. So that can move the market. That can affect the tone. Of uh, major currencies or currency pairs in the early part of the month, uh, so that month, next month starts next week, and then of course you have the employment reports, uh, a, uh, the uh, ADP employment report, uh, NFP on next Friday, and uh, what else I'm missing there? I think there's a uh, is there a central bank decision as well that we have? Well, we, we, the usual central banks meet next week, I believe, but uh, one that especially to keep an eye on could be the Australian central bank. I'm checking the calendar to confirm that, but I'm pretty sure the uh, the first uh, central bank up is going to be uh, the Aussie, the Reserve Bank of Australia. Probably want to look to verify that. And by the way, the official event is the official webinar is over. And while I'm looking that up, I, I do want to thank again FX Street and every one of you for attending this event. Thank especially FX Street for for inviting me back and for making this event possible. And as I understand it, this event was recorded. Um, FX Street will um, will make the recording available. Uh, folks, you tell me how, how, how FX Street, anyone there, uh, and when is that posted? I'm not I'm not trying to, to force you to uh, do to get done like right away, but in case people ask, uh, is it like tomorrow, uh, 24 hours from now? I don't know how long it will take for them to do that, but they do. They usually do it in a very timely fashion. Yeah, there's a, uh, a Reserve Bank of Australia, the Australian Central Bank uh, policy decision coming up um, during uh, next Tuesday's Asian session. 
that could certainly shake up the odds, even if the even if the Australian Central Bank does nothing. Plenty of uh, plenty of Australian data now next week. That's pretty pretty typical for the the uh, start of the week. See the one central bank meeting beyond the uh, RBA that um, that could uh, attract attention could be could be the um, Bank of England. I mean the ECB just announced that bond buying program last month, so I don't expect anything dramatically new from the ECB unless they uh, deliver a surprise rate cut. It's uh, it's probably the Bank of England that may attract more attention. Uh, I get the impression from a recent uh, uh, comments by a, a member of the Bank of England's uh, Monetary Policy Committee that uh, the Bank of England may feel like they're kind of losing the, the currency wars here, losing the battle to, 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 to uh, depaced currencies. Yes, uh, Mike, uh, I can do that. Hello, AT. I think I can do that. <laughs> I may have to log in, actually, to, Epic, to Forex Street. By the way, we also have a. I also post the, uh, the blog at fxbookcap.com, but uh, I actually prefer to give you the uh, because we're here at Epic Street right now. I prefer to give you the uh, my forexstreet.net blog. And uh, honestly, I don't have the. Uh, hang on a minute. Let me see. If I got to sign into it and see what the actual URL is. You usually remember such things, but uh, I don't think in this case. Yep. Uh, I believe what we'll do it for you is go to my well, it's my profile page. I, don't, I believe that's uh, what would uh, constitute my blog. Hang on a minute. Yeah, I guess it should have been intuitive, but uh, wasn't sure. Especially didn't remember the you know the the profile word in there. Well, uh, again, I will post the eventually. I'll, I'll try to make it sooner or later. But I I got some other things to add here. Perhaps possibly some annotations even to the graph that I showed you here of the volatility by time of day on the euro. I may add a couple annotations to that. And, Anyway, I'll, I'll post that soon. So, and then I, I can tell you right now. I can tell you right now the the general profile for other major currency pairs very similar to this, very similar to this. Again, greater price action on the whole, uh, greater bigger candles that is during the New York morning session than during London session. You're pushing higher. You're approaching that. the 29.30 zone has been important in the past. Not the best time of day typically, but. Uh, at one point, 29.30 area has uh, has affected price action on the euro previously. Uh, folks, thank you again for your uh, for your time, for your attention, especially for your participation. For anyone who made comments and questions, and uh, thanks again to FX Street. And look for a copy uh, 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 the recording uh, posted on the uh, Forex Street. I'll tell you what, I will also uh, I haven't done this in the, in the recent past, but I'll do it this time. Uh, uh, once I get an email from uh, from uh, FX Street. Providing the link to the uh, recording of this, I'll, I'll reference the recording in the um, on my blog as well. Folks, have a great day. Thank you again. Cheers.